technology and discussion. Our second discussant is John Elfling. He has served as the Associate Commissioner for the BLS Office of Survey Methods Research since January 2004. He received a 1987 PhD in statistics from Iowa State. He's on the tenured Department of Statistics faculty at Texas A&M University, specializing in sample design, survey non-response, measurement errors, small domain estimation, quantile estimation, and time series. From 1999 to 2004, he served as the senior mathematical statistician at BLS Office of Survey Methods Research. He's a fellow of the ASA, an associate editor, editor of several major journals. As the Associate Commissioner for Survey Methods Research, Dr. Elting is responsible for management of a wide range of methodological research projects to address the needs of BLS production programs, for cons consultation with BLS senior management and BLS programs on methodological research, and for cross-office coordination on recruitment and, re and training of methodological personnel. Dr. Elting. <coughs> Um, thanks very much, Ed. Um, I'd very much like to thank uh, the organizing committee and Professor Pfefferman for the opportunity to discuss uh, this paper. Um, before I begin the formal comments on that, though, I'd like to respond to uh, Professor Brown's uh, last question. Uh, I'm always an optimist. It's a whole lot more fun to be an optimist. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit more at the end. Um, I did very much like this paper. Uh, its methodological perspective on the production of official statistics provides a lot of food for thought and is a very nice tribute to the continued legacy of Morris Hansen uh, in his work in the Federal Statistical Agency, uh, as well as the private sector, and also his impact on the uh, broader academic community as well. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, my discussion will cover two general topics and will hold technical details for the written follow-up. Uh, first of all, I'd like to provide some additional context to which we can understand and interpret uh, Professor Pfeffer's main ideas. Uh, and uh, people get any feedback or no? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, place special emphasis on goals for production of official statistics and on an extended definition of design uh, for official statistics. And I'll provide a little bit more context uh, for his remarks. Uh, in a second, I'd like to suggest some extension of nuances for some of Danny's proposals. Now, before we jump into details, a brief note on labeling. Uh, Danny uh, pr provided uh, consideration of seven primary topics, which he labeled A through G, and he also raised some important questions about training in official statistics. I'll label that last topic as H as we work through here. Um, now, I'll begin with some discussion of context. Uh, for official statistics, a general mission statement uh, would be to provide high-quality, cost-effective statistical information for a wide range of stakeholders. And there's broad consensus on those general principles for good practice uh, to fulfill that statistical agency mission. Uh, in the U.S., the Committee on National Statistics has crystallized those ideas into a very nice principles and practices book. Uh, and there are related statements for other countries and at the international level. Now, those statements highlight several common themes like quality, integrity, transparency, cost-effective management, and risk management. And the remainder of this discussion is going to summarize those themes uh, with the term balance of quality, cost, and risk, or in some cases, maybe shorter form, simply performance. That's what we mean by those terms here. Now, living up to those general principles is never easy, and I'll highlight six challenges for official statistics, statistics that are especially relevant to the ideas that are presented uh, here by Professor Puffman. Uh, first of all, we need to have a clear understanding of the information uh, that we're trying to provide to our data users, our customers, what's really of the greatest value to them. And second, we need to take a careful look at the ways in which our profile of quality, cost, and risk for a given set of statistical products will align with those data users' needs and also align with sustainable revenue streams. So in fact, we can continue to produce those uh, types of estimates on a regular basis. Uh, third, our official statistics have many of the characteristics of so-called public goods 
as defined in the formal economic literature and consequently we need to recognize that our stakeholders needs are often very heterogeneous and may not be fully articulated one of the major tasks for statistical agencies in the u s. and elsewhere is in fact to try to understand as much about those heterogeneous needs as possible to understand the particular segments of those needs that we can truly meet in addition Danny referred to this briefly but we see this a great deal in the united states and quite a number of other countries as well cost and resource issues have very important practical effects on the ways in which we meet our stakeholders information needs for example high quality statistical work requires very intensive investments in human capital and other forms of intangible capital and that in turn often involves fixed costs this ties into Danny's last topic age especially in addition operational constraints often dominate our efforts to optimize the balance of quality cost optimize the balance of quality cost and risk and as a result of that when we look at statistical agency decision processes about the types of products they'll try to produce and how they go about producing them often what we find is that their decision processes look like minimax or satisficing as opposed to formal optimization as such despite the fact that our formal developments that we have in mathematical statistics for example developing types of estimation methods that Danny described earlier tend to be focused and framed in an optimization setting now that gives us a little context on the goals of official statistics in addition it can be useful to think about Danny's eight topics in the context of a four dimensional expanded definition of design of an official statistics system those dimensions for this discussion will include both user needs and methodology as well as production system and management and as indicated in this slide each of these dimensions intersects with one or more of Danny's topics now there's a fairly broad consensus that all four of those dimensions are important for official statistics that's the easy part the hard part comes when an agency works through very complex trade-offs and interactions among these factors and then reaches decisions about exactly what to do with each of Danny's eight topics now to explore these trade-offs I believe it's useful to consider a schematic model and I'll emphasize the word schematic here as a practical matter it would be very unlikely to have the empirical information available to comprehensively estimate the parameters of the models that we'll discuss but at a conceptual level I believe that this model can provide some useful structure for discussion of Danny's topics specifically suppose we have a design vector X that contains separate sub vectors that represent decisions that an agency will make regarding our four dimensions of design again evaluation of user needs methodology systems and general management in addition let's suppose that we have a related vector we'll call it Z that represents uncontrolled aspects of the operating environment for agencies in some sense we can think about Z as a form of metadata or paradata then for each of our multi-dimensional performance criteria again quality cost and risk we could consider defining a performance service that is somewhat analogous to a response service that we see in engineering for example if one of our dimensions of data quality Q is the mean square error of a key estimator as Danny was referring to in this discussion of small area error then based on appropriate transformation T of that quality measure we can think about that transformation as being approximated by a function of certain main effects and interactions of the dominant design and environmental factors that we can measure and in some cases control a relatively simple version of this that in fact goes back to the Hanson et al. 1953 book our models are approximations for approximate variances as functions of sample size as well as weighted effects and other design factors in addition we can consider approximate surfaces for the other performance criteria again cost, risk, and stakeholder utility that brings us back to the ideas that Danny proposed earlier in each of the seven methodological topics A through G each of those is very interesting in its own and when we think about his ideas and about the ways in which we can target or apply those ideas to a particular application setting we need to get some sense of the ways in which they can help us to improve aspects of our balance of cost, quality, and risk 
In some cases, uh, the effects of uh, one or more of his proposed methodological uh, procedures uh, may in some sense be additive, at least locally, uh, in the sense that we can assess the potential improvements that we might attain uh, in a way that is largely independent of the context uh, defined by the other factors like our user needs, our systems, and our memory. In other cases, though, we may see very strong interactions among the methodological factors uh, and the other design factors. Consequently, the potential improvements uh, from these methodological proposals may be in some sense much more conditional. We may need to understand an awful lot about the other features of our production system before we can understand the perspective impact uh, that these ideas would have. And that, that gives a very nice reinforcement uh, to the importance of empirical testing of these proposals, maybe emphasizing a number of points in the slides of this paper. In addition, statistical agencies often encounter operational risks, essentially a form of slippage uh, from the nominal settings of some of their design subfactors. And developing appropriate robustness of that operate against that type of operational risk or slippage uh, can involve some very complex theoretical and empirical work. I was thinking about that especially when we were seeing uh, Danny's last comments about the importance of topic H, university training, especially at a very deep level, both in terms of theoretical and empirical development. So that provides some general context uh, for Danny's eight <coughs> topics uh, centered on agency goals and on general ideas of design. And I'll suggest some extension of nuances for some of the ideas that we presented in those eight areas. Uh, first of all, for areas A and B on big data and computing, uh, Danny's comment on bigger and bigger uh, resonated especially with me. Uh, it's very consistent with a lot of other authors' suggestion that alternative data sources could constitute a so-called disruptive uh, technology, uh, which in turn has led to a very wide range of opinions amongst many stakeholders. In some cases, we hear stakeholders uh, view some of these comments as essentially a form of pipe. In other cases, they say, no, we better take this very, very seriously. Um, I think, in fact, that uh, the really interesting story with this uh, is something that Danny had pointed to in a number of places uh, in his presentation today and in his paper, which is the really interesting action is down at a somewhat finer level when we go from a very broad picture to looking at more specific particular cases and the value they may be able to deliver. Uh, on at that more specific level. Um, in addition, I believe it's very worth, much worthwhile to note that the responses that we're seeing, uh, both within the statistical community and with the broader set of data users and general public, um, in fact, are very consistent with the type of broad social phenomenon that arise very frequently when any given community wrestles with uh, the adoption and diffusion of a new form of technology. Uh, Everett Rogers. Everett Rogers has a very nice book uh, on that general area. And a lot of his observations from other technological areas may offer some very nice guidance about constructive ways in which the statistical community uh, can work through the changes that are going to be arising as we think about alternative data sources, including so-called big data. Uh, in addition, I believe that developments in big data and data science areas are part of a very broad and deep, essentially multi-decade, uh, societal reconsideration of the nature of information and especially about statistical aspects of information. Uh, that includes expectations uh, that many of our stakeholders have regarding quality, cost, risk, credibility, accountability, and access. And many of the reactions that we see in the press accounts that we see related to so-called big data are often reflecting those types of societal expectations and the changes uh, in those expectations. It also involves some very important questions of resource allocation. That includes both the amount of societal resources that are going to be allocated to particular areas of statistical information and also the mechanisms by which that allocation is going to take place. Now, for the producers of official statistics, uh, I believe that this leads to three general questions uh, about so called big data. And Professor Pfeffer's presentation today contributes some very important answers for each of these questions. Uh, first of all, we need to ask about what may change uh, based on the emergence of big data. Uh, that includes the changes in the expectations of some of our stakeholders, as I described a moment ago. And it also involves important changes in the performance surfaces, again, the surfaces of the schematic models that I was suggesting a moment ago, for quality, cost, and risk. Uh, for example, Danny talked about modeling for small area estimation. 
That's essentially replacing labor costs for direct data collection to some degree uh, with intangible capital investments in modeling and um, model evaluation. Uh, in addition, many places very strong on this is both in the slides in this paper, on the importance of model validation. That's essentially a crucial step in reducing the component's risk related to model failure. Again, as he's uh, suggesting by Kate taking certain actions, we can, in fact, modify the type of surface I was referring to a moment ago. Now, similar comments apply to many of the other areas that Dan highlighted in this topic C through G. Um, in particular, I'd emphasize here the general idea of record linkage and the emphasis that he placed on that. Thing one that uh, is especially important is going to continue to be especially important for us as we wrestle with a number of these areas. Uh, I'd also uh, highlight his um, note and comments about the special appeal we may see for certain sources that may provide measurements that are very difficult or impossible for us to obtain with standard sample survey methods. Now that's the first question. What's, uh, what in fact has changed? The second question is what stays the same? And here the answer, I believe, would center on core institutional values like quality, integrity, transparency, credibility, and cost effectiveness. Uh, core institutional values that I referred to a moment ago. And those core values provide, I believe, a very useful framework through which we can evaluate the perspective, perspective benefits and pitfalls in the use of so-called big data or alternative data sources. Uh, for example, a standard multi-dimensional definition of data quality involving relevance, accuracy, timeliness, and so on, extends very naturally to non-survey sources. Uh, to take one case, the accuracy component fits with the population coverage issues and the microdata typology that Danny highlighted. Uh, similarly, the accuracy and relevance uh, components provide some traction for our evaluating stakeholder value that we provide uh, through more refined temporal and cross-sectional data. Applies to so-called big data areas, also applies to some of Danny's comments about geospatial data as well. And the third question that our agencies need to deal with uh, centers on extensions of current concepts, theory, and methodology to address new data sources. Uh, two examples would be Danny's discussion of auxiliary information and different flavors of auxiliary information and usage uh, that he displayed uh, in the middle sections of his presentation. And also the discussion of model, model validation under topics A and B, and this discussion of mode effects under topic E. Now, I believe that for statistical agencies, uh, those three general questions in turn lead to three very important challenges. Uh, the first one is to recognize the umbrella term that uh, big data covers an extraordinarily wide range of potential uses. And we need to focus our efforts in sub areas that have reasonable prospects. Um, that includes a potential uh, for very high quality statistical work uh, and also consistency with agency mission and also conditions that can lead to constructive decision process. We will really get something out of this at the end in terms of high quality products that we can produce for our users. Uh, the second is to uh, develop a very realistic, adaptive, and iterative process to explore the three central issues that I described a moment ago. Um, I certainly don't know, and I don't know too many other people who believe that they know. Uh, essentially exactly where the trajectory of these uh, evaluations are going to be. Uh, but we need to have a very clear roadmap about ways in which we can try to tackle that uh, in some sense bite-sized pieces that we can really manage. And a third challenge is to learn as much as we possibly can for our colleagues in other fields uh, we're also wrestling with related issues. Uh, one example of this is the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, which ties into some of Larry Brown's comments about uh, observational data as well. Uh, Andy also covered separate topics uh, C through G, uh, and in the interest of time, I will not cover those uh, in the formal um, uh, oral presentation here today. Cover that in the written follow-up comments uh, in some depth. Uh, but I would like to finish by adding a few comments uh, about my uh, suggestion we should be very optimistic uh, about training as we look forward. Uh, Dan, we did have a wonderful discussion in preparation of uh, students for work in national statistical offices. Um, and it's a very nice follow-up uh, to Sharon Morris Hansen lecture from 2009, uh, which centered on development of both technical skills and so-called soft skills. Uh, in addition, both Sharon in her paper and also Jim Lepkowski uh, in this discussion uh, also noted that the preparation of students 
uh, needs to help them also understand in a very uh, clear and deep way, in a practical way, the professional norms and standards uh, that guide our work. Um, in addition, I suggest that preparation should also include uh, background for students in a lot of long-standing issues at the interface of government, science, and citizens. Uh, one very good example is especially salient for the United States uh, federal statistical system is, my goodness, why are we so decentralized? Uh, we know there are efficiency issues related to this. I was puzzled about that too. Uh, and then as part of my training as I was moving into management uh, about a dozen years ago, I uh, had a course in which we were required to read the Federalist Papers. And you get about two or three papers into that and you say, oh, that's why we're decentralized. Madison set it up that way. Um, and in fact, that's what we're living with today. Uh, but getting those sorts of ideas about the background, the societal and governmental context in which we carry out our work, that can really help us to navigate that in, in uh, more effective ways. And I believe that that final point is going to be especially important as we address changing societal expectations uh, related to big data as we covered in the last few minutes. Uh, in essence, uh, we're not alone, um, and in fact, we can benefit from learning an awful lot about how people in other areas of science have wrestled, wrestled with the relationship again among science, government, and the citizenry uh, previously. Um, <clears throat> in addition, uh, Danny noted that current training options show some bright spots, uh, but also show some important gaps. And in diagnosing those gaps, I believe it's important to uh, then do three things. Uh, first of all, we need to be very intentional in aligning skill areas with practical agency needs. We naturally are looking at a limited resource base, and it's going to be very much uh, worthwhile to say, well, why exactly are we investing resources in certain areas? We need to be able to explain in a very clear and articulate way that will resonate with a lot of different stakeholders why training in these areas really will have a very important effect, again, on quality, cost, and risk um, that we can deliver an improvement in that profile that we can deliver to our data users. Uh, second, we need to be prepared to make very substantial, sustained, and focused investments in high priority training areas. Uh, comments that we hear every year at the start of this discussion, paying tribute to Morris Nance, they're very much on target. And I'm always amazed uh, to hear two things coming out of that. First of all, the incredible trajectory of his contributions uh, to the federal statistical system over many decades. And second, the impact that he had on so many people, both uh, in, in uh, essentially formal mentoring relationships as peers and, and otherwise. Um, and I think that really speaks to the importance of making very serious, sustained long-term investments in this type of uh, uh, skill development uh, in many different dimensions of skill. And then second, finally, we need to have very clear feedback groups uh, that give management to decision makers very clear indications of the impact uh, that long-term training has on agency capabilities. So, in closing, Professor Pfeffer has presented a very nice paper, very um, appropriate and a very productive contribution to the tradition of Hans Memorial Lectures. And I believe that should stimulate some very productive follow-ups. So, with that, I'll turn things back to Eric.